welcome to Close Call. Today we are here with Nick Persico, who is the Director of Sales here at Close, and we're going to be talking all about how to implement a CRM. There are so many steps involved in it. It can be overwhelming for people when they're looking at implementing a big software decision like a CRM. So we're going to get Nick's take on how sales leaders and how startup founders can smooth out this process and make it as easy as possible. So my first question for you, Nick, then how would you just quickly break down the steps of choosing the right CRM for your business? So when you think about a CRM and its most basic function is that it acts as a database or a storage of records for your company as it relates to your customers and your prospects, the folks you're working on, hopefully becoming customers. And that's it, right? Like don't make it more complex than that. All of the things that happen around the CRM, where the leads come from, what happens after they become a customer, how do we charge them money? All of these other things that orbit the CRM are things that can be tackled separately or later. But what's critical is thinking about it from, this is going to be your database of record of where these relationships that you have outside of your company are stored. And that's the first place to start is thinking about how the data structure or in a database terms, your schema is going to be for how you describe the current relationship status and the current attributes that you have for a given customer or a lead or an account, whatever terminology that you want to use. Think about that database schema first and then find the CRM or database that has the UI, UX, or bent towards what your particular product or service or industry is. The CRM market is so rich and vast in terms of CRMs that are built specifically for given industries that may actually help you solve a lot of these schema questions or the database structure questions because the CRM kind of already figured that out because they only have to do it for that specific use case or for that specific industry. So that's the first place to start is, is that database of record and how you want that data to be stored and presented in a UI or a UX. That's interesting. So it makes more sense to focus on the industry or the market that they are in rather than going towards one of these CRMs, like a sort of all-in-one tool like Salesforce or one of these that's just enormous. Yeah. I mean, look, you can go with the route of sort of an empty box and you can build it up to whatever you want it to be. And there's a lot of complexity with that, but with that complexity it gives you flexibility. It's just how much are you willing to invest in that? Or you can go to more a way, the opposite of an empty box, which I would call more of like a furnished apartment where all the tools are already in there. All of uh, the stuff is ready to go, but you can't change the paint color. You can't change the furniture that's in there. It's very limited in your flexibility. But the complexity is way lower and the ability to get started quickly is there too. And there's CRMs that sit on both sides of that spectrum that you can work with. The other thing is, as we talk through all of this, is that this is not a isolated decision that you're going to have to live with for years and decades to come, right? There's CRMs for different stages of your business. And luckily, the industry at large has gotten better at allowing you to export data with very low friction into other systems. And also as your data model or that scheme that I talked about of how your database structure evolves too, because when you start in the early stages as a startup or, or a company, you're going to be very basic. And then as your business gets more complex, that database is going to get more complex. So maybe you'll need a more complex software or stack to accommodate that. So don't think of this decision as something that you're going to have to live with for the next 10 years. 10 years ago in the CRM space, this was an issue. It was very difficult. You get your data out. There was no APIs. That is not the case anymore. You can pretty much get your data out at any time, or there's APIs to be able to get it out in its most basic format. You should not worry about that at all. That makes sense. So what should sales leaders know about their CRM when they're looking to purchase and they're testing out different systems? What is a CRM really supposed to be for and what is it not? So I think the single most important thing that founders and sales managers miss is that they try to use the CRM as a lead generation tool. 
and it is not. So what we believe is most important is that what should go into the CRM is leads that are already generated, that you've already got an initial response from, or they're warm in some way. Do not import all of these lists that you purchased from somewhere, or you scrape from somewhere, or you put together and dump that all in the CRM and expect magically to close those deals. That's not going to happen. What you need to do, especially in this day and age, is you need to have these systems separate and you need to think about the stack separately. So let's start at the top. If you don't have any leads and you want to generate leads, that is its own tools, its own process. Usually it's its own people, not at first, the founder does everything at first, but as you start to break this out and start to build roles within your sales and marketing team, the whole lead generation process needs to be totally separate from anything going on with the CRM and the salespeople actively working on active leads. And when you separate those two, the decision for the stack that you're going to make for lead generation and the stack that you're going to have for your CRM and communication stuff becomes much easier now that they're separated. So when you're trying to generate leads, that's its own stack and its own thing. And then once those leads hit a certain milestone and the milestone is defined by you. So that milestone could be, you got an email response, you booked a meeting, they filled out a form on your website. Any of these trigger events is the event that then puts it into the CRM. And the only data or leads or accounts that should be in the CRM are the ones that you expect a human or your product to work to convert. Not ones that your marketing team or your lead generation team is going to try and convert. That's higher up in the funnel. So in summary, you need to keep your lead generation machine and stack separate from your CRM stack and basically send that into the CRM in an automated way when there's a certain trigger event in that sales and marketing process that you are going to have a actual human go and work on. And in most cases, it is they filled out a form on your website and became an inbound lead that goes into the CRM. When you get a response from somebody cold or you booked a meeting or things like that, you can define it however you want. That is the key thing that I see a lot of teams mess up is they try to get their CRM to do all this stuff and it's just not possible. It's not feasible. You need to be nimble on the lead generation side. The tools and the methods are going to change way more rapidly than the CRM does. So trying to do both of these things in parallel is just really tough. You need to think about them as separate entities entirely. That makes so much sense. Because we do this all the time on sales. People are like, hey, is this a replacement for Zoom Info or Apollo or whatever? The answer is no. You need to have that system and it's going to change 50 times. There's going to be some new darling that comes out that's better than Zoom Info or better than Apollo. You should feel free to change and use all that. But the moment that you get a response in Apollo or you book a meeting, that's when it goes into close. And when we tell people that, they're like, oh, okay, I get it now. And then it becomes way easier to go with close or with any other CRM when you don't have to worry about how the leads get generated with the separate discussion, separate silo. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. So once a sales leader, for example, has the CRM that they have in mind, they've chosen the one that they want. What are some strategies that you would suggest to get buy-in from the rest of the team? Because obviously in most cases, they wouldn't be making this decision alone. So what are some strategies to help get the rest of the team on board? So the best way to do that is to break it down by use case and the person that you're trying to get on board. So let's break these out. Let's start with leadership. They don't care about how easy it is to send an email, how easy is it to create an opportunity. They don't care about that because that's not part of their day-to-day -day job. They're not interacting you know, with that on a day-to-day -day basis. They're worried about the results, the reports. How do I know what's going on? This reactive type of usage. So when you're trying to get a leadership person on board that's going to use the product for that, your pitch needs to be entirely about that. Don't worry about the other stuff. Are you going to be able to get the reports that are required of you? And are they going to be happy with that? And then if you bounce over to the other side of the spectrum, which is the salesperson, which for any early stage company or any company rather, I believe, and we're biased here, but I believe that this is the most important thing to focus on is the actual productivity of your salespeople. That is going to always yield better results in terms of closed deals and retention and all these types of things. So I would just focus on that the most as opposed to getting reports to the leader. That's less of a priority, but you report to that person. So it feels like something you need to do or over the other one. So I get that human element of it, but in, in a practical sense, it probably shouldn't be the biggest thing you 
you focus on. But for the salespeople and their productivity, it's all about how can they do their job and complete their job in that tool or a very small amount of tools. So basically, how do you get 95% of the total expectations of them being good at their job out of that tool or those two tools? And it's easy for them to steadily increase or maintain the same level of outreach and results that they're able to get. Automate these sort of mundane tasks that are tedious and they're unlikely to do, like logging activities or five steps to send an email when they could have just went into their Gmail account and sent the email. So that's where your pitch should focus with them is how this is going to make them more productive uh, and what benefits that they're going to get out of it. So that's what you focus on there. And then for operations and for instance, marketing folks, it's, can I get this data out of the CRM and into whatever other tools that they're going to use? Because their tools are always going to be different. So are you worried about the API? Does it work well with Zapier or these other types of no code tools or, or solutions. So you're just basically building different pitches uh, to different audiences like you are in sales or marketing, but you're just doing it internally to try and go in with a pitch about productivity to somebody that's not using the product every day and a leader, just it's going to fall on deaf ears. They're not going to care. They care about reporting. Uh, so you want to bring that message to them about what they care about. And that should resonate and that should bring you over the hump uh, to get you, you know, what you need is, is just break it out into different pitch types. Yeah, that makes sense. Because obviously for each person, it's going to be something different that's important to them when it comes to the new CRM. So then talking about all of this comes up the idea of timing. How long does it actually take from the time that someone decides that they have chosen their CRM, they know what they want, going through the process of getting buy-in from the rest of the team, negotiations, signing the contract, and then actually getting their team into this new CRM. Generally, how long does that take? Well, it shouldn't take longer than a few weeks. Let's start with a goal-based approach. I'm going to choose a solution and choose a route that's going to get this up and running within weeks, not something that's going to take a year because that doesn't help anybody. That doesn't get anybody results. It ties down a lot of resources and probably creates a lot of unnecessary friction for everybody involved. So I would do everything in my power to make this a weeks long process, not a months or quarters long process. And really the X factor in making this a weeks long process is before you even pick the CRM. And that's where your current data is stored today. What we typically see is the thing that takes the most time for people getting onboarded to close, for example, is when they come and they, they want to make a decision on a CRM, their data is not in order. So if they chose close today or any other CRM, they're not even ready to get that data into the system. So examples of this is their data hasn't been exported from the previous system. The data hasn't been cleaned up at all. There's no awareness or no thought that went into how we're going to adjust the data to work with our new sales process that we're going to do with the CRM. Cause usually you're doing both in tandem. Um, because you're switching CRMs to hopefully find a better tool and get access to better products to make your team more productive. But also too, it usually has to do with some sort of sales process change. You added new people to the team and then you want the people to start fresh. You're changing who you're pitching to or you're changing your sales process model or things like that. So you're gonna add a new system to it at the same time. This makes sense you should do this. This is a good idea. Uh, but that's typically what's happening when this is going on. But what usually traps people for weeks and weeks and weeks on end with no results is that the data was messy when it went in there. So when it went into the new system, it got even messier. And then they used to be unwound and fixed, or they have to spend weeks going and doing the tedious cleanup and changes and all of that before they go and import it. So I would focus on the data part and then go worry about the CRM after that, have some good and clean data to be ready to go. And then that will trim it down to days. So if you have a clean data model that you're ready to import and you're clear about any knowledgeable success or support team on many of the CRM providers is going to be able to help you get that data in quick because they're experts on it, especially if you're telling them exactly what you want the data to look like as a result. So really ideally when someone is ready to buy or ready to purchase a new CRM, they already have cleaned up their data and they have everything ready to go. Ideally doesn't happen, but ideally, yes. That just smooths out the process for everyone though. Yes. Does this happen that maybe sometimes 
a team has already decided to purchase a new CRM like Close, but they're still paying for the old CRM because they still haven't cleaned up their data and they still haven't imported it. Yeah, happens all the time. People are trying to straddle two CRMs at one time because they're struggling to get the people off the old system and into the new one. Really, for a salesperson, when the value strikes for them on the new CRM or the new process, whatever that is, it's when they see their data, their activity that they've done previously represented in the new CRM in a better way to help them be more productive. That's really what sells them, nothing else. What really matters at the end of the day and what we've seen increase the usage of a CRM within a given company when they switch is when the sales rep logs in there for the first time, they see their accounts, they see their past activity, they see their tasks, and then they're ready to go. That, that's what they respond to. When they go into an empty CRM and the data is messier from their already messy previous CRM, they lose interest. This is no better than what I currently have. This is a waste of time. I'm going to do this begrudgingly and not be an active participant in making things better. I'm going to slow us down. Uh, either they do it consciously or subconsciously is up to them. But yeah, that's where you need to focus your time is making sure when they log in the first time, it's an experience unlike any other that they've had previously. So that also speeds up the timeline of moving people over. So basically the point is if you want to do it fast, clean up your data first. Exactly. <laughs> Get that done first. Don't even worry about choosing a CRM yet. <laughs> exactly right. I love that. So what about the cost of CRM implementation? A lot of people focus, obviously, when they're purchasing a CRM, they're focused on the cost of the actual CRM. Are there other costs or purchases that a sales team would need to do when they're transferring to a new CRM? Yeah, all the outreach tools that they need to do their jobs. What tool are they going to use to actually have meetings? Zoom, Hangouts, or whatever tools that you want to use for that. Are they making voice over IP phone calls or SMS messages? You're going to need a provider for that. And then how are you booking the meetings and handling the scheduling? There's a tool for that. So there's a lot of different tools in the stack that you're going to either connect to your CRM or your CRM already has. And it's about making sure that if the CRM already has it, that the team knows how to use it and is instructed to use it. And then they can start getting that value to where that's one less tool that you have to go buy off the shelf somewhere else. So when you think about the cost, it's the per seat cost of the salesperson in the CRM, not much you could do there, but where you can save on cost is making sure you're getting the most value out of that product that you purchased. Because a lot of CRMs these days have these communication tools built in, which is good to reduce the number of other tools that they're logging into on a daily basis and using as part of the stack. So you just need to look at all of these tools and do the ledger and figure out how much this is going to cost per person. But luckily there's overlap in a lot of these tools these days. So let's use Zoom, for example, you're going to host your meetings on Zoom, but you're also using Zoom as an employee you know, of the company to have internal meetings. So really that's a blended cost. It's just the cost of doing business these days. So you shouldn't associate that with the cost of a salesperson's seat because you're using it for other things. So when you put together that stack, I don't believe in this truly all in one. I believe you can get like 80, 90% of the way there, but there's going to be some room you should have for new tools as things change over time. New amazing products get, get developed and come into the market, but you should work to reduce those as much as you can. The cost is really up to you in terms of how many tools you want to add and how much burden you want to add on the salesperson to do what they need to do. But yeah. So when a sales manager is going to start implementing a new CRM, they've made the purchase, they're ready to start moving forward, migrating data. What are some of the challenges or maybe mistakes that a sales manager or whoever's running this project might make as they're moving things into the new CRM? How can they avoid some of those pitfalls? The biggest mistake sales managers make is they don't actually sit down and do the jobs themselves for a couple of days or a week to see what it's actually like. Because when they're evaluating a CRM or a tool that they're going to bring into their sales and marketing stack, it's all theoretical, right? In theory, I can use this feature. And in theory, the salesperson can do this or do that. In theory, they can send a thousand emails a day, whatever it is. It's not actually proven until you sit down and try to do the job to where you can prove that out or not or understand what the pitfalls are. And it also allows you to create empathy with the salespeople. And that's always going to put you in a better position with them in terms of their trust and them following 
the guide that you want them to follow is logging activities and doing the things that you want them to do to keep the CRM clean over time. So you really need to sit down and actually test it out yourself. That will usually yield out any issues or pitfalls that you may find that the salespeople may run into. And the advice is simple as that. Use it and try it yourself. Don't make it theoretical, make it real. And then build your documentation off of that. I love that. I'm just curious. Is this something that like sales managers don't normally do? Like they just do research and like, okay, I think this one will work without actually testing it as a salesperson. Yeah. I think two things pull on and create tension there. So the first thing is they're just busy people that they report to want progress reports. They want updates. There's a human resources element to it. There's all that stuff that's happening on a daily basis that takes the attention away. That's one thing that's always pulling on you and preventing you from doing the advice that I just said. But then the second thing is they're basing their assumptions off of what they did when they were an account executive or a business development rep, a BDR or SDR three or four years ago. So they're taking that past experience, which is valuable. Don't get me wrong. It is valuable, but they're trying to apply that to today. And we all know that the landscape of sales and marketing is changing rapidly and it's changing at a pace that's faster than ever before. And that pace is only going to accelerate. So what you did two, three years ago probably does not work or works in some different way than it does today. So in my opinion, you need to be constantly selling or having some percentage of your time selling to keep yourself honest so you can empathize and understand what the salespeople are dealing with. And not enough sales managers do that, in my opinion. They like to stay away from it and base it more on theory or their assumptions of what's going on or getting feedback from people and not getting the actual hands-on experience themselves because it's changing rapidly. And that's why to this day, as a director of sales, I'm still on a few sales calls a week. I still work in the CRM. I still keep myself in the rotation just to keep myself honest and stay up to date on what's going on. So when the feedback comes in from my sales team, I agree with them usually because I experienced it myself. And then I'm a way better advocate for them on their behalf up the chain to leadership to get whatever change or do whatever project that we want to do to make their lives better or our ability to sell the product better. Awesome. That's such cool advice. So then talking about this, especially working together with the sales team between the sales manager or director of sales and the, the reps themselves, what would you say is the best strategy to get a sales team using a new CRM once it's purchased and it's ready to go? How do you get reps to start actually using it? Yeah, it's a tough thing. I'm not going to claim that this is easy, but again, it's, is the CRM, the core database is that the same place that they actually do their job? And I think you'll often find that the answer to that is no, right? So if you look out into what a lot of teams are using in terms of their sales stack is they have the CRM where all the data flows into, but then they're actually doing the activity in some other tool. They're making calls, they're sending emails out, they're creating sequences or campaigns and what have you. And they're not actually in the CRM doing anything or elsewhere. And then that data usually gets lost in translation or doesn't make it to the CRM, which the manager, the director of sales is always pulling the data out of. They're not going into the other tools. So for us, it's always been about, can you create a stack where the salesperson is spending the majority of their time doing their job in the same place that the CRM exists and the amount of windows and products that they have to log into the amount of those that you reduce on a daily basis, the usage is going to go way up because they don't really have an excuse that, Hey, I was in another product trying to do X, Y, or Z. They're just always in the same one. So it's always there. So try to keep it simple as best you can. And the usage and all of that will follow. I like it. Sometimes it's, I think, easier to have a complicated tech stack than to have a simple one. Right. <laughs> Last question that I had then for you, once someone has already finished their process for choosing the CRM, they've already picked it, they've purchased it, they've implemented it, the team is using it. How would a sales leader measure the success of that new CRM? How do they look at it and say, okay, we made the right decision. We're good. Are the KPIs and the results that you're trying to achieve at a high level on the team better, higher, 
and growing at a good clip. This is the greatest part about sales is that it's always a numbers game. It's always the results that matter and then speak for themselves. So the pass or fail of a good CRM implementation is, are we reaching more people? Are we creating more opportunities? Are we closing more deals? And is that conversion rate going up across that whole process or each stage of the sales process? That's the case. Then you did a good job. It's as simple as that. And how much time should go by before they start seeing these kind of results? So this depends on the stage of the business. And this is how I think about goals also is the same framework. So if you're an early stage startup and you're just getting started, you're thinking of week over week. If I'm a little bit more mature than that, I had a few people on my team and we're building a predictable sales process, then you live month to month, you make decisions and set goals on a monthly basis. And that's the same frequency of time that you should look for better results is the following month. If you are a mid-stage business, this is what I would put close in as a category. We live quarter to quarter. So we set goals on a quarterly basis and we look at results on a quarterly basis. And then if you're more of a late stage, big public company or something like that, you tend to think year over year. Well, that's when you see in earnings reports and things like that, when they're talking about like sales numbers and results, they're always talking about year over year. How did, are we performing this year versus the same period of time the previous year? That's what I mean by that. So that's how to generally think of it. So if you're a larger company, you have to wait a year for all those things to pan out. If you're somebody like us, it's quarter to quarter and then on down. That makes sense. So those were the, the questions that I had for you. We actually did get through all of them. <laughs> Look at that. Nice. So thank you so much for joining us.